title of the message is Understanding Religion and Spirituality. Understanding Religion and Spirituality. There's a great debate today over the credibility of religion to the point that religion has become a bad thing. It's used in negative ways. At the same time, there are a variety of opinions as to what is meant also by spirituality. These two concepts, religion and spirituality, have actually been pitted against each other in a religion versus spirituality contest. And I don't think that that's fair. And yet we're all in some ways guilty of it. We're all in some ways, whether subconsciously or consciously, engaged in that same religion versus spirituality contest. Often people who don't like a certain pattern or a certain method or a series of protocols that may take place in the church will label such things as the product of a religious spirit. Have you ever noticed that? Discipline, expectations, authority, codes of conduct, standards of righteousness that are followed in the church are sometimes and oftentimes labeled religion, even unspiritual, as if these things like discipline and authority and, and, and loyalty and submission and codes of conduct and expectations and righteous standards, as if these things are bad things. They get lumped sometimes by certain people into a category called religion as if they're carried out or conducted by a religious spirit. And when that happens, it obstructs our growth, it obstructs our understanding, it obstructs our comprehension of the fullness of the Word of God. I think it's important to be careful. Say careful. I think it's important to be careful how we throw around terms and how we categorize things. We do so loosely without really understanding what we are saying. And sometimes we can attribute an evil or indifferent spirit to people or places without understanding the damage we do to the church of the Lord Jesus Christ and to the kingdom of God, not to mention the people who we're labeling. Sometimes we say things are her her heresy or that person's heretical or or that person's hypocritical. And sometimes we use these labels and we use these terms without fully understanding what we're really saying. And we need to learn. Say learn. We need to go to the Word of God and find out the severity of such an accusation and what it means to label people in certain ways rather than to do it flippantly or casually. Because when we do it flippantly and casually, we ourselves become guilty of such things that we're accusing others. So today I want to address this issue as I speak on the topic, understanding religion and spirituality. So let's pray and ask God's guidance this morning because I definitely need it. Father, we love you. And we're grateful for this time to open your word and to gain great, greater insight into it. Father, may we have your heart and your mind. And may we, Lord, rid ourselves of our own ways of thinking. May we die to flesh, die to self. And may we live unto your spirit. For this we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. The first thing that we need to do this morning is we need to differentiate between pure religion and false religion. We also need to differentiate between what I call isolated spirituality and incarnational spirituality. Now that's a big word and hopefully we'll get to it. If not, we will eventually in time. But I would like for us to turn our attention to the book of James chapter 1 and I want us to observe verses 19 through 27. Are you there? Say amen. It says, know this my beloved brothers, let every person be quick to hear, slow to speak, slow to anger, for the anger of man does not produce the righteousness of God. Therefore put away all filthiness and rampant wickedness and receive with meekness the implanted word which is able to save your souls. But be doers of the word and not hearers only, 
deceiving yourselves. For if anyone is a hearer of the word and not a doer, he is like a man who looks intently at his natural face in a mirror. For he looks at himself and goes away and at once forgets what he was like. But the one who looks into the perfect law, the law of liberty, and perseveres, being no hearer who forgets but a doer who acts, he will be blessed in his doing. If anyone thinks he is religious and does not bridle his tongue but deceives his heart, this person's religion is worthless. Religion that is pure and undefiled before God the Father is this to visit orphans and widows in their affliction, and to keep oneself unstained from the world. Did you notice what the Word of God says? It says religion that is pure and undefiled before God is this, to visit orphans and widows in their affliction and to keep oneself unstained from the world. The author of James is telling us here that pure and undefiled religion before God is to act. It is to love. It is to care. It is also to govern oneself by avoiding worldliness. In other words, there is a religion that is pure and undefiled. There is a religion that is good and wholesome and holy. This statement also communicates something unsaid. That if there is pure and undefiled religion, then there is also impure and defiled religion. There is such a thing as false religion. The question for us today is what does pure religion and false religion look like? And have we in the 21st century developed a misunderstanding about religion and therefore see anything religious as evil or bad? And I think that's true that we've done that because I hear it all the time. I hear people always say, I hate religion. I don't want to operate in a religious spirit. I I just see that as religious. And you've heard it. How many of you have heard that before? Let me see your hand. All right, good. A number of you have. Enough of you for me to validate the message. In order to answer these questions, though, we must further define religion, and then we'll contrast that with various forms of spirituality. The Oxford Dictionary defines religion as the the belief in and worship of a superior being with controlling power, especially personal God, personal God or gods. End of quote. Now, this is a very generic definition, and while it is accurate, it does not take into account the concept of religion that we just read about in the book of James. James, when writing about religion, was defining pure religion. Say pure religion. And he was defining it as the external evidence of inward piety. The external outworking, if you will, of what legitimately exists on the inside of an individual. That is, worship as expressed in ritual acts. In other words, pure and undefiled religion happens when believers take care of the less fortunate and also strive for personal purity. So if that's the case, and that's what James defines for us, and we know that to be true because we believe that the book of James is inspired by the Holy Spirit, right? So this is God speaking to us. It is God defining religion, pure and undefiled religion. So whoever's not taking care of the orphans and the widows in their distress, and whoever's not in pursuit of personal purity, is unreligious or operating in false religion. Come on, you can say, oh, me. That should hit home to some of us. Because while we talk a good game, we don't play a good game. While we, we want to accuse others of being religious, we ourselves are, are, are more religious, but in, an, in a false way, in an ungodly way, in a defiled way, in an impure way, because we're not doing what James defines pure and undefiled religion to be. We're not taking care of the orphans. We're not taking care of the widows. And we're certainly not after personal purity, but rather we're submitting to our flesh more so than anything else. Don't make me just hesitate and pause there for a while. So, 
Religion is not necessarily a bad thing, although there are forms of it that are. There is this thing called false religion. Now, we need to be able to differentiate between pure and undefiled religion and not just categorize everything religious as bad. Because if we're not careful, then what we do is we add to the Scriptures. And we, not, we must operate within the context of the Scriptures. But we also can differentiate between pure and undefiled religion with false religion. And that's what Jesus did. Take your Bibles and now turn to Matthew chapter 23. Matthew chapter 23. And we're going to read a number of verses and see this whole conversation rather or this it wasn't really a conversation it was a a rebuke by the Lord Jesus Christ on the Pharisees the pharisaical system of Jesus's day is an example of religion without life now there's religion with life and there's religion without life And this is an example of religion without life, an activity that neither helps others in need nor pursues personal purity. And Jesus confronted this system by declaring several woes on the scribes and the Pharisees. So let's begin reading in verse 13 of Matthew 23. It says, But woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites! For you shut the kingdom of heaven in people's faces, for you neither enter yourselves nor allow those who would enter to go in. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you travel across sea and land to make a single proselyte. And when he becomes a proselyte, which means convert, to make you make him twice as much a child of hell as you are. Woe to you, blind guides, who say, if anyone swears by the temple, it is nothing. But if anyone swears by the gold of the temple, he is bound by his oath. You blind fools. For which is greater, the gold or the temple that has made the gold sacred? And you say, if anyone swears by the altar, it is nothing. But if anyone swears by the gift that is on the altar, he is bound by his oath. You blind men. For which is greater, the gift or the altar that makes the gift sacred? So whoever swears by the altar swears by it and by everything on it. And whoever swears by the temple swears by it and by him who dwells in it. And whoever swears by heaven swears by the throne of God and by him who sits upon it. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you tithe mint and dill and cumin and have neglected the weightier matters of the law, justice and mercy and faithfulness. These you ought to have done without neglecting the others. You blind guides, straining out a gnat and swallowing a camel. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites! For you clean the outside of the cup and the plate, but inside they are full of greed and self-indulgence. You blind Pharisee! First clean the inside of the cup and the plate and that the outside also may be clean. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites! For you are like whitewashed tombs, which outwardly appear beautiful, but within are full of dead people's bones and all uncleanness. So you also outwardly appear righteous to others, but within you are full of hypocrisy and lawlessness. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites! For you build the tombs of the prophets and decorate the monuments of the righteous, saying, If we had lived in the days of our fathers, we would not have taken part with them in shedding the blood of the prophets. Thus you witness against yourselves that you are sons of those who murdered the prophets. Fill up, then, the measure of your fathers, you serpents, you brood of vipers. How are you to escape being sentenced to hell? Therefore I send you prophets and wise men and scribes, some of whom you will kill and you will crucify. And some of you will flog them in your synagogues and you'll persecute them from town to town so that on you may come all the righteous blood shed on earth from the blood of righteous Abel to the blood of Zechariah the son of Barakiah, whom you murder between the sanctuary and the altar. Truly I say to you, all these things will come upon this generation. Don't tell me I'm a mad, mean preacher. I think Jesus had some passion going on here. Can you imagine being in that congregation? I don't think Jesus, well, he didn't build a very big church while he was here on earth, did he? He could only muster 120 at the end of his days. But the bottom line is he was speaking the truth. 
You see, it's significant that Jesus singled out the Pharisees instead of singling out the Sadducees who were more liberal and the Herodians who were more political. The Pharisees, while attempting to honor the Word of God and manifesting an extreme form of religious observance, were actually further from God than the liberals were. Further from God than the politicians were. And so it was something that Jesus didn't have to deal with because it was obvious the liberals didn't believe God and therefore they lived at least a little more in line with what they believed. The politicians were certainly not being provoked and rebuked by Jesus because they were just doing what politicians do. But the Pharisees, they were a little different. They said they were one thing while living and being another. And therefore, that required rebuke. That's why Jesus constantly throughout this passage calls them hypocrites. It was the common word in this passage, hypocrites. You say one thing, you do another. You act one way, but your heart is indifferent and cold, and so you're not really legitimately what you say you are. You're a hypocrite. So Jesus went on to strongly point out why he was rebuking them the way he was, why he was coming on strong against this pharisaical system that had emerged and developed. And so I want to give you several things out of this passage that you can process and think about in light of where we are today in the 21st century. The first thing that we see is that the Pharisees hindered hearts from the kingdom of God, hindered hearts from the kingdom of heaven. This is what false religion and false Religious leaders do. In verse number 13, we see that they did all they could to shut others out of the kingdom of heaven. False religion and pretense are always the worst enemies of the truth and are far more dangerous than immorality. It's far more dangerous than even being indifferent. As the religious leaders of the Jews, they were held guilty before God of blocking the way for others seeking to enter into the kingdom of heaven. But false religion is also when professing Christians live in such a way as to hinder others from finding eternal life. See, you professing Christ, but not living for Christ out here in your workplace, or living for Christ in your neighborhood, or living for Christ in in your recreational uh, organizations and all the things that you do, wherever it is that you do it. If you're not living for Christ out there, then you're guilty as much as the Pharisees are guilty. You're a hypocrite just as much as Jesus declared them to be a hypocrite because you profess one thing, but you live an entirely different way. See, character is when our words and our deeds match up. Integrity is when our words and our deeds match up. Righteousness is when our words and our deeds match up. They were hindering people from coming in to eternal life. It's called hypocrisy, pharisaical living, if you will. And Jesus was rebuking them, and he's rebuking the church today for the same thing. Secondly, we find in verse number 15 that the Pharisees misguided men with a wrong message. They misguided men with a wrong message. The Pharisees were described as extremely energetic on both land and sea to make proselytes of the Jewish religion. Sometimes we get really zealous and we want people to come to our church or we want people to do certain things, but because of our hypocritical way of living, we're one way in the church. I I, I remember one time a guy came and he brought somebody with him. He was excited and he brought a guy with us. This is years ago. It wasn't even in this church, so don't worry. There's nobody in here. And, and the guy was worshiping the Lord, and he was saying amen to the ser- sermon and all that good stuff. But this buddy of his, he had a relationship with outside the church. And the buddy later, several months later, came to me. He never came back to church, and I went to him, and, and we talked about it. And I said, why? Why didn't you never come back? He goes, well, it was interesting. He said, my buddy been after me to go to church and go to church. I went to church, and I saw the way he acted at church, but that wasn't the way he acted when we were together outside the church. He said, and it sent mixed signals to me. He was so excited, so excited about me coming to his church, and I just figured he'd be the same there as he was here, but he wasn't. He was a totally different human being. Even his speech was different. And he said, I don't want to be a part of anything like that. 
He said, I'm looking for something real in my life. You see, that's the same thing the Pharisees were doing. They were making proselytes, bringing them into the Jewish religious system. But Jesus says, now they're becoming just as much the children of hell as you are, Pharisees. You're counterproductive. You're not helping these people at all because of the very life that you're living. You see, they were misguided, and they were misguiding others with a wrong message. And then there's a third thing that Jesus rebuked them about in verse number 16. It tells us of the trickery of the Pharisees who held that swearing by the gold of the temple is what legitimizes one's oath to God. Think about that. Jesus denounced them as both fools and blind, as obviously the gold was meaningless unless it was sanctified by the temple. And the gift on the altar was meaningless unless it was given significance by the altar. See, when you come to the altar, it's about you bringing your heart to the altar, and that's really all that Jesus wants. But if you, if, if you come to this altar and bring your heart, and if I were to say, wait a minute, wait a minute before you go back to your seat, you, you said you just gave Jesus your life. All right, where's your billfold? Come on, pull your billfold out. How much money you got in your wallet? Because you can't go back to your seat and this oath be real, this commitment you made to God be real, unless you put your billfold on the altar. Now, how ridiculous would that be if you heard me say every one of you would get up and walk out and you would declare that that pastor's a false teacher? Because I would be if I made that kind of declaration. And the Pharisees were doing this very thing. They were saying to people, your oath to God, your commitment to God, your decision for God is only as valid as your bank account. Hypocrites, blind, foolish. And Jesus was rebuking this in the strongest way he could. Accordingly, Christ concluded that an oath based on the temple, and the temple represented the presence of God, based upon your experiencing the presence of God, was binding, not what you have in your pocket. Just as an oath based on heaven carried with it significance of the throne of God, Jesus said, and God who sits on the throne. But the Pharisees would only bless based upon one's gift of gold and receive people into fellowship based upon what benefited the Pharisees. Let me tell you something. Don't just be friends with people based upon what you can get from people. Don't just witness to people that you think, wait a minute, that guy's, that guy's got some money and he's got a business. If I can get him in my church... So you go witness to someone because they have money, and you bypass the homeless guy who needs Jesus is just as much as the guy who has money. How pharisaical is that? That's false religion. And then Jesus moves on in verse number 23, and he begins to talk to the Pharisees about them majoring on minors and neglecting the essentials. It's about hypocrisy in their tithing. While they were so concerned in paying the tithe and down to the smallest spice, the smallest seed, they omitted the really important matters, Jesus said. Obeying the law and manifesting mercy and justice and faithfulness. How many of you know those are the things that Jesus emphasizes? Should we tithe? Of course we should tithe. Jesus went on and even made that point. He said, you, 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 should, you should not have neglected justice and mercy, nor should you have neglected paying your tithes. But your tithes don't mean anything if your heart's not right. God doesn't need your money. You need to give. But you need to give out of a heart desiring to give unto the Lord in appreciation and gratitude for all that He's done for you and for the power that He will give you in order to display justice and mercy and faithfulness and fruitfulness for the kingdom of God. See, there's a purpose to everything that God calls us to do. He doesn't just, He doesn't need your money. He, he owns the cattle on a thousand hills. He owns many more hills than a thousand. That's just a symbolic number, which means He owns it all. But these guys were priding themselves on their behavior, on their actions, on their religion. You know, we tithe. You know, we, we do it just exactly right. But inside, they were rotten to the core. How many times people want to 
you know, something's going wrong in their life, so they want to come and give their offering. They want to come and do something, you know, just kind of a one-off, kind of like this message. It's a one-off message, right, from the series we're in. But they want to do a one-off, hoping that they'll find favor with God so they can go back out and their problems are solved. How many of you know it doesn't work that way? See, at the end of the sermon, I'm not going to say, hey, if you'll bring $100 to the altar, guess what? God's going to bless you and your problem's going to be gone. You might hear that on TV. But you're not going to hear it here because they operate in a false religion. We're operating in a true religion where we're saying, listen, give your heart to the Lord, and guess what he'll do? He'll make of you something special. He'll give you compassion for people, and you'll go out and minister to the homeless and to the poor and the orphan and the widow. And guess what? He'll also give you a desire for personal purity. That's pure and undefiled religion when we desire to be right with God. I just want to be right. I want to be clean inside. I don't want to have a bad conscience and a bad mind and a bad thought life. I want to know when I lay my head on my pillow at night, I can lay down with peace with God because everything between me and God is okay because I've been living repentant today. Every moment of our life is to be lived in repentance because we're all going to get dirty, right? I mean, we live in a filthy world. It's like when Jesus said, you know, you're going to take off your sandals, I'm going to wash your feet. Why, did he, why was that such a significant thing, washing of feet? Because it symbolized you're walking through a dirty, dusty world, and you're going to be picking up dirt and dust as you walk through it. But there comes a time when you need to be cleansed. And the only thing that can cleanse you is the ongoing flow of the blood of Jesus, which started forth from the cross of Calvary. You see, you, you've been saved, but you're also being saved. And one day you shall be saved. So it's a past, present, and future thing that God is doing in our lives. It's justification, sanctification, and ultimately glorification. Hallelujah. But that process of sanctification means that there are things being worked out of us so that there can be things worked into us by the grace and the glory of the Lord. Somebody ought to shout and say amen. But these Pharisees were majoring on the minors and neglecting the essentials. But then Jesus goes a little further, and he says that you Pharisees have been emphasizing the external, and yet you're empty on the inside. Now, I know that that point has been made already in this message, but we're going to keep emphasizing the things that Jesus emphasized, and some things he doubles up on. And if he doubles up on it, it means it's a matter of grave importance. This is a fifth woe pronounced in verse 25 where he repeated the charge that they were hypocrites, merely actors acting out a part. He charged them with cleaning the outside of the cup and the platter but being unconcerned with what was inside where cleanliness really mattered on the inside. Say on the inside. He meant by this that they were concerned with ceremonial cleanliness. That which men observed, but not really concerned with true holiness. And while observing ceremonial rites of cleansing, they were not above extortion and excess in their lives. In verse 27, Jesus goes on and continues. He described them as whited sepulchers or tombs, if you will. Whited tombs that had been made beautiful on the outside, and white on the outside, but within they were full of dead men's bones. This illustrated that the Pharisees were outwardly righteous, but, but inwardly they were hypocritical and filled with iniquity. How many times do we look good on the outside? You know, we do all the right things, we say all the right things. We might, sometimes we might even serve someone and do good towards someone, but the motivation in our heart was to be seen. The motivation in our heart was to give somebody else a false impression of who you really are. How many times do people do that? They'll show up, they'll do certain things, but they're only doing it because, you know, I don't really want to do this, but I'm going to do this because, after all, I don't want a bad reputation. I don't want anyone to think poorly of me. As opposed to, I don't really care if anyone sees me. I know this is a need, and God has moved on me, and I want to meet this need because this is the Jesus way of doing things. 
See, it's about motive. It's about what is in your heart. And that was the problem with the Pharisees. They were doing all the right things on the outside, and so they had people fooled. They had people tricked. Everyone thought they were these high and mighty spiritual people. But really inside they were empty. They were like a tear instead of a wheat. You know the difference between a tear and a wheat? On the outside they look identical, but on the inside the wheat has seed, but the tear is empty. And that's exactly what the Pharisees were, empty on the inside, but looked really glorious on the outside. And so Jesus continues on. The Pharisees verbally rejected sins of their fathers in order to to become current, to become contemporary, to get into the into the century that they were in. They didn't want to live in the sins of the past, the sins of their fathers in the past, so they verbally rejected the sins of their fathers, but they were still actively as guilty as their fathers were. And Jesus was pointing this out to them as well. He he charged them with building tombs of the prophets and garnishing them with decorations and claiming that they would not be partakers with their fathers in martyring these prophets Jesus called this very witness to account, that they were the children of those who killed the prophets. And he told them in verse 32, fill ye up then the measure of your fathers. In other words, do what your fathers did and even do worse. Now, he wasn't giving them permission to do that. He was just declaring a prophetic word with regard to what he knew they were going to be doing. Because he knew their heart. Their heart wasn't legitimate when they were saying, we know our fathers messed up by martyring the prophets, but we're not going to be guilty like our fathers were. We're going to honor the prophets. And yet Jesus knew that in just a few short months, they were going to be persecuting him, crucifying him, and crucifying his followers. You see, they, they could say one thing, but they were about to reveal their true stripes. Are you hearing me? And in verse 33, Jesus addressed them, you serpents. In other words, you're a liar. You don't speak the truth. You're a generation of vipers. You're your whole generation. Everyone like you is just like the fa- your fathers who, who tortured and martyred the prophets who spoke the word of God. And here the very word of God is standing in front of them. Jesus, the word of the living God, is standing in front of them. And they're trying to pull the wool over his eyes. But he says, you're a whole generation of vipers. You're not just a handful. You're a whole generation of vipers. How can you escape the damnation of hell? Now, it's interesting that, that when, he, when he talks about hell here, he describes the scribes and Pharisees as poisonous snakes, just destined for terrible judgment, which would be their hell. And he, and he uses the word Gehenna here, not Hades. He's talking about Gehenna here, which is the place of eternal punishment, eternal damnation. Now, that's a pretty tough condemnation. So, in summary, the Pharisees were characterized by a partisan attachment to and rigid practices of traditional law false religion, pharisaical system. The Pharisees were characterized by an inordinate reverence for learning and human reason instead of depending upon the spirit of the living God to interpret the word of God. The Pharisees were conservative traditionalists. They were characterized by military exclusivism. They only wanted certain people in their sect, in their group, in their, in their movement. The Pharisees were lovers of ostentation and position and preeminence and adulation. They wanted pats on the back. They wanted the applause of the, of the crowd. False, all these are characteristics of false religion. They were inconsistent in their teaching and practice. The Pharisees exalted the external and ceremonial above the inward and the spiritual. And finally, the Pharisees were rabid persecutors of all who differed from them. Now, I know I went through that fast, and I'll make that available next week, that list of things in case you want it. But the bottom line is this, that if, if people didn't line up just exactly with the Pharisees, then they were exclusive. They didn't bring them the truth. They brought them their own version of it. And how many times do we do that with people? We bring our own version of truth. 
And, and people run around going all the time. And I, wanna, I don't want to get too sidetracked because I'm finishing this message right about in a moment. <laughs> Got you, didn't I? But people always talk about absolute truth. Yeah, we have absolute truth. We're standing on absolute truth. You don't have absolute truth. There is absolute truth. Come on, say amen. There is absolute truth. Jesus is absolute truth. But you don't have absolute truth because you're human. So for you to go around and pride yourself, I have all the truth and people need to listen to me and I've got it all right. No, you don't. No, you don't. you got a thimble full of right. That's why the body of Christ is necessary. We need each other. We need teachers and structures, but we also need interaction and dialogue. We need to be able to explore and discover the Word of God being led by the Holy Spirit. But no one person has all absolute truth. We're in discovery phase. Only when Jesus comes shall I see Him as He is, and then I shall be like Him, and I'll have the fullness of the revelation at that point in my life. But until then, we're all in process. So that's where grace and justice and mercy and tenderness and kindness is all required of us in order to bring people to a place to where if we, if we are all discovering Jesus, then we get closer to absolute truth in our journey towards Jesus than we are in trying to rationalize and reason out our way and understanding of what we think to be true. Does that make sense? Now, I don't say that to discourage you from pursuing it. I say that to encourage you to pursue absolute truth. But don't, don't have an attitude or an ego relative to it. Be gracious and kind and tender and gentle. Bold, sure. There are things we absolutely know. But there are some things that we're not sure about that we're in discovery about. But the, but the Pharisees felt they had absolute truth, and they held on to absolute truth. And they, had, they believed the Old Testament, the Word of God, more so, and they knew it better than anyone sitting in this building right here today. And Jesus said, you search the Scriptures, and in them you think you have found life. But the problem was is that they did not have a humility about themselves to be able to discover truth in a relational context. But they lived solely in a false religious context. And that makes the difference between religion and spirituality, of which we'll deal with in a future Sunday. But today, I say that religion and spirituality are not at odds. Can I get an amen? Religion and spirituality are not at odds with each other and have areas of historic and doctrinal overlap. However, as it is understood today, spirituality gives the individual autonomy over his or her own interpretation of their soul or their spirit, whereas religion is a lens, the lens through which such interpretations can be made. Religion implies participation in a communal practice and interpretation of divine beliefs and worship. So in reality, religion and spirituality should work compatibly with one another. Come on, did you get that? Hey, I know we're at the end, but don't bail out on me yet. Religion and spirituality are compatible, should be compatible with each other, not opposed to one another. An easy, easy way to differentiate between the two today is via structure. Visualize this as I close. I am closing. We are about to end in less than three minutes. Religion typically has set creeds and teachings along history of scholars and texts and clear leadership, right? Religion places an emphasis on communal gathering. Right here, we have communally gathered. Communities of faith that organize around a shared belief. That's why we're here. We have a shared belief system. It requires membership and embodies practices and beliefs shaped over the course of history. And although it can vary widely from various groups, religion often has some sort of leadership structure. And Paul outlines that as he describes how the local church should operate in cities. That's all religion. Good religion. Because the system, the structure is designed to meet needs that are defined by James. And to help us pursue personal purity. 
whether within a specific local communication of believers or a global structure, such as many in the evangelical, apostolic, Pentecostal, even the Catholics have structures that define them as a religion. And some religions, and I'm not saying which ones, but some religions can be bad and false, and some religions can be good and spiritual. Spirituality is the internalization of truth, while religion is the outworking of that truth. Religion is defined by an external set of laws that governs behavior, while spirituality is an internal set of laws that empowers self-government. That was the difference between the Old Covenant and the New Covenant. The Old Covenant, they had laws written on tablets, and they would check them all. Okay, all right, I did not take the Lord's name in vain today. Check. I didn't covet my neighbor's horse. Check. But they had to live according to these laws by the energy of their willpower. Good, good laws. Pat them on the back. They did well. Sometimes. But the law was not given to show them how good they could be. The law was given to show them how evil they actually were. The law points us to a coming Messiah. Because when Jesus comes, he comes to save us from the sins of our heart, and He gives us the Holy Spirit to live on the inside and to put the laws of God on our heart. So now we don't look externally to follow. It is now an internalization of the truth of God's Word found in Christ and His cross that we embrace so that now our motivation comes from within and we're able to self-govern by the will of God and by the Word of God. That's what discipline and disciples are. They're self-governed from internal power, Holy Spirit, according to the Word of God that's been imprinted upon our heart. If we don't know the Word of God, then how can we live according to it? If we don't give the Holy Spirit that lives on the inside of us the Word of God, how can we trust Him to empower that Word to live itself out of us? The internalization of truth and the outward expression of it, that is the difference. And that is what we need to know, and that is how we will grow. Amen? My three minutes just expired. Would you bow your heads, please?